Hi there. Welcome to Peace Lutheran Church. I'm so happy that you were able to be with us today. My name is Jason Teal. I serve as the pastor here and have the privilege of leading you into God's Word today. Just a couple of quick instructions as we begin. If you would like to follow along with a service folder, you can download that on our website, peacelutheranboulder.com. Same page as you'll find this video that you're watching right now. Or it's, if you're watching on YouTube alone, you'll, you'll find it in the description and you can download it there. What you'll see there, page one, there's just a couple of helpful things to get you started. Um, first of all, there's a digital connection card. There's a QR code or there's a link in the PDF to click on that. That just is a wonderful way to be able to know who our worshiping family is today. It gives me an opportunity to pray for you, to welcome you and to serve you as you give feedback on the digital connection card. So please fill that out if you're able to. There's also a link to an opportunity to give thanks through your offerings. If you're a guest today, please don't feel obligated to do that, but you are certainly welcome to as you are moved by the Lord's love. And then there's also a link to be able to serve not just with your offerings, but with your time and talents as there is a volunteer link as well. So check those out. Today, as we gather around God's Word, we're going to take a look at, at an event in Jesus' life called the Transfiguration. It's an event where he reveals something that he doesn't normally reveal during his earthly life, and that is his divine glory. He shines with all of the glory that is rightfully his as true God. And how that applies to our lives is we're going to see that it's exactly what we need to get us through trials and temptations and challenges in this life. The glory that is Jesus's that helps us to see that that's who our true God is, but it also helps us to see that that is exactly what he came to this earth to win for us, and that'll be ours someday as well. And so may God lift you up and strengthen you as we take a look at that message today, the message of transfiguration. Let's begin our worship today by our first musical meditation, All Glory to Our Lord and God. All glory to our Lord and God For love so deep, so high, so broad The Trinity whom we adore Forever and Let's now confess our sins. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. 
And you can say these words along with me. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Therefore, hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that we who bear his cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory and so be changed into his likeness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God now and forever. Amen. We now focus our hearts and our minds on some lessons from God's word. Our first lesson today reminds us of where we can experience true glory. So often we are looking for glory in so many places, but the only place we find real glory is in Jesus Christ. And anytime we are in the word of Jesus, that's when we have the real glory, the glory of the good news of sins forgiven in him. A lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, is the same one who made light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. At this time, I would invite children to kind of gather around and have a message from Jesus just for you. Hey kids, we're going to be taking a look at a very interesting thing that happened to Jesus. It's called transfiguration. Can you say that big word? Transfiguration? Wow. That's pretty impressive. Nice work. Maybe you can teach that one to your mom and dad. Transfiguration. I'm going to tell you what that means by giving you an example. What does transfiguration mean? Well, let me ask you this. What is the brightest light that you've ever seen? Is it that flashlight that you have at home that you shine in the dark and you can see a long ways? Is it your mom and dad's headlights on their car where you're driving at night and you can see all the way down the road? Is it the sunshine? Yeah, that's so bright that we can't even look at it, can we? Yeah, that would hurt our eyes. That's really bright. It lights up the whole world. That's, that's a pretty bright light. Is it that white shirt that comes out of the laundry? Glowing white. Those are all pretty light. The, one of the bright lights I thought of was this. This is... Uh, one of the lights I use as I'm recording videos like this and I put it by my face and it shines and, and it lights me up so you can see me, but boy, it makes spots in my eyes. It's so bright sometimes. Yeah, what's the brightest light you've ever seen? Well, I ask you to think about that because the Bible says that Jesus became like the brightest light you've ever seen. That's what transfiguration means. It means changed. Now, what did Jesus change from? Every day, the disciples saw Jesus just like they see you, would see you. He looked just like you, like a normal person. But on the mountain of transfiguration, Jesus changed. He was transfigured. And he became glowing like the brightest light you've ever seen. The Bible says he became dazzling white, Whiter than anybody could ever wash your clothes. That's how white Jesus was. 
Wow, what does that mean? Well, what Jesus was showing his disciples was what he really was, who he really was. He is God. Now, why was that so important for the disciples and why is that so important for you to know? Well, the disciples were going to see something very soon. They were going to see Jesus go to the cross. And while we know that the cross is a good thing for us, it wasn't a pretty thing to look at. There Jesus suffered, and there Jesus had blood on him, and there Jesus died. And you can imagine looking at Jesus on the cross and crying and saying, Oh no, what happened to Jesus? Is this who he really is? But when the disciples saw that, they could go back and they could remember the transfiguration and they could remember seeing him glow brighter than the sun, brighter than the cleanest laundry. And they could remember, oh yeah, Jesus is true God. And we can remember that too. As we look at the cross, certainly we become sad too. We're sad because we know that our sins were what made Jesus go there. But what Jesus did on that cross was pay for the sins. And when our sins are paid for, all of a sudden he gives us all of his glory. When God looks at you, And when God looks at me and he sees all of our sins gone, it's like he's seeing us transfigured, that we are shining with all of Jesus' glory. And one day, we get to be in that glory with Jesus. And so every time you go through something sad, every time you look at the cross and become sad, remember Jesus' transfiguration. Remember him glowing with all the glory of the sun and remember that that's who he truly is and that's what he came to give you, glory. Happy Transfiguration Day. Amen. We now turn our attention to the gospel of the day which will also serve as the basis for our sermon meditation. So the gospel according to Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There, he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents or shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. It comes to you through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So God's word for our focus today is the gospel lesson that you just heard from Mark chapter 9. It's the account of Jesus' transfiguration. Now, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the whole transfiguration account. Um, It's certainly a big churchy sounding word, isn't it? So if, if you're not familiar with it, I totally get it. But let me... Let me let you in on a little secret. Those of us who are more familiar with this account, we, we tend to do something every time that we hear this account. And what we do is we kind of poke fun at one of the characters in the account. And, and specifically, I'm talking about one of Jesus' disciples named Peter. We kind of poke fun at him for what he says. Do you remember what he said? He got up on the mountain and he's like, Hey, I've got an idea. Let's put up these shelters. And we say, oh, Peter, you're so silly. Why did you even think of that? And I think we do that because the Bible itself even says he didn't know what he was saying. And yet, I was thinking about it this week, and you could look at it in a different way. Look at it from the perspective of a guy. 
Look at the circumstances. Here is Peter with his buddies, and they're taking a hike up a mountain. They're going to a, a desolate wilderness place. Hey, I watch the Discovery Channel, don't you? I see what survival people do in those situations. What's the first thing they do when they're out in a remote wilderness place and they're trying to survive? They put up a shelter. They start gathering sticks or, or rocks, anything they can. I even saw a survival show once where a, a man was in Africa and he found a big pile of elephant dung and he started using the elephant dung and he made this lean-to. It's, it's the instinct, right? Put up a shelter. What about Bear Grylls? What would Bear Grylls do in this situation? Oh, you know, he would put up just the perfect shelter that would not only keep the rain off, but would also gather it so he'd have a, a nice supply of fresh water. So come on. Take it easy on Peter just a little bit. How can you blame him for just blurting out his primal instinct in a, in a remote place? Let's put up some shelters, Right? little different perspective there. And, and I get it. You're probably thinking, okay, Pastor, you've, you've watched way too many survival shows, and you're probably right. That's probably not exactly what Peter had in mind in this account. I think what Peter had on his mind when he said, let us put up some shelters, was this. He wanted to be up there just basking in all of Jesus' glory, all for himself, and just... Just bask as long as he can and not have to go back to reality. He just wanted to linger there. And that's why he didn't really know what he was saying. That, that probably wasn't the best for him. But I'm going to go with my twist just to help us understand, just to, to help us uh, work through this text. What if Peter did have survival on his mind? If survival was what Peter was talking about, survival from dangers, then he was pretty close. He was pretty close to what Jesus wanted for his disciples and for us on this Mount of Transfiguration. So let's go with that and, and let's use that as our theme to help us discover uh, this whole text in Mark chapter 9. Let's put up a shelter on this mountain. And as we do, we will see that we will be able to survive whatever dangers come our way as well. Now, what is it about survival shows that really draws us in? I think, first of all, it is that opening sequence because the opening sequence of a survival show really sets the stage for what a survival show is all about, the dangers and surviving those dangers, right? In the opening sequence, it always goes like this. It's an aerial shot, and it's usually of this place that looks like paradise. There's, there's nice water features. Maybe there's palm trees and things like that. But then as the aerial shot focuses in, what it focuses in on is the danger. It's not quite paradise. You'll see the sharp teeth of the area's most dangerous predators. You'll usually see venomous vipers you'll you'll see <laughs> this scene of the main character grabbing something squishy and slimy and having to eat it so he doesn't starve to death yeah it's the dangers that draw us in because you know that you have to survive those dangers that's a good setup for this whole transfiguration event as well not that jesus was worried about predators on that mountain he wasn't worried about starvation. He wasn't worried about any slithering snakes there. But he did have dangers in mind. And that's exactly why he takes the disciples. That's exactly why he takes us up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Here's the opening sequence that sets up those dangers right before our text. If you go back in your Bible earlier before this, Mark chapter 9, you'll hear Jesus say these words to his disciples. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. You talk about dangers. Understand this. Jesus is 100% God. And he's revealing that with these words. 
<clears throat> as God, he knew exactly what was in store for him shortly after Mark chapter 9 when he's on the mountain of transfiguration. And he describes it here. He's going to go and he's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected and he's going to be killed. He knew about those things. But know this too. Jesus is not just 100% God. He's also 100% human being. He shares the exact same flesh and blood that you do and I do. And so imagine knowing those things and being human. There's going to be some fear there. And certainly there's fear there for Jesus. This wasn't something that he was looking forward to. This was not going to be a pleasant experience in the least. But I think when it comes to fear of these dangers, Jesus' biggest fear wasn't for himself necessarily. It was for the people around him. The people that loved him. The, the people that, that followed him. The people that, that believed him in him and put their entire faith and hope in him? What was going to happen when those people experienced those things happening to Jesus? You talk about dangers. Jesus was afraid for them because he loved them. Can you imagine going through those things as his disciples, as those people who believed in him and followed him and trusted him? Boy, if, if those things were going to happen to Jesus... If people were going to accuse Jesus, even though Jesus was absolutely perfect, what was going to stop them from accusing his followers? And when those accusations came, Jesus knew that there was going to be a real danger for his disciples, for his followers to doubt him. What else was going to happen to Jesus? If those people were going to reduce Jesus to a bloody mess, how were his followers and trusters going to take that? When they saw him all bloodied up, Jesus knew there'd be danger there. The danger for them to be ashamed of him and maybe even to deny their faith in him. Jesus knew that he was not just going to suffer. He was going to die. He was going to succumb to death. And if these people's faith, if their their entire hope for eternity was in him and they saw him die, boy, that would be a huge danger. They'd have the danger of losing their whole faith itself. Do you see why Jesus was afraid? <laughs> afraid for his followers? These were real dangers. How were they going to survive those things? How were they going to survive experiencing all those things? Well, it wasn't anything that they were going to be able to do. Peter said, let's put up some shelters as though he had the strength to be able to survive it. He was going to put up what he needed to survive. That wasn't going to happen. Instead, what really happens is Jesus puts up shelters for them. He gives them what they need to survive. And know, know this, I, I'm, I'm speaking in a metaphor, right? Jesus wasn't going to take sticks or rocks or anything else and, and put up literal shelters for them, but he was going to give them everything they needed to survive the exact dangers that were on his mind, the dangers that I just listed for you. So in a short time, when the truth was trampled, when his skin got skewered, when his hands were hammered, when blood and bruises blurred Jesus beyond all recognition, the disciples could seek shelter and survive on what they saw on that mountain. Here's what I mean. What did the disciples see on that mountain of transfiguration? Well, Mark 9 says this, There, on that mountain, Jesus was transfigured before them. And then it explains what that means. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Think about what that means. They got to see Jesus in all of his glory as, as true God. And so, later on, soon after this, when they were looking up at the cross and they saw Jesus in all of that horrible state, they could go back to the mountain. They could remember what they saw there. That they saw the Holy Son of God shining with all of heaven's glory. And then after the cross, when, 
when the grave engulfed Jesus and they were tempted to have their faith fall and, and when questions quieted all the hope they had in their heads and their hearts, the disciples could go back to the mountain and they could seek shelter and survive on what they heard on that mountain. Do you remember what they heard on the mountain? It says, A voice came from the cloud, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to him. And not only did they hear that, as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. He talked about his resurrection too. So even after all those things happened, after the, all the effects of the crucifixion and they had these things going through their mind, they could remember the transfiguration. They could remember the conversations they had with Jesus and how he spoke of the resurrection and that would give meaning and fulfillment to all the things that they were, that they were witnessing. Do you see what I'm saying? They were up on this mountaintop and if they could just hold on to what was happening, they would not only survive, they would thrive with the glory that they saw Jesus have. They could thrive with the glory that Jesus was going to the cross and the grave to win for them too. Everything they needed to survive those sufferings and those dangers was right there. All those truths. And so if you look at it like that, wow, what a loving thing for Jesus to do this for his disciples before those things happened. I'm going to go back to those survival shows I was talking about before. And you're going to think, oh, that's all Pastor does is watch these survival shows. No, I'm just using them as an example today. But, but anyway, when I do watch those, something always strikes me about these shows. It can be a different episode it can be a completely different survival show filmed at a different time in a different location and basically they're all the same. They all have the same kinds of dangers. They might have a little bit different name. They might present themselves in different ways, but it's all about surviving the same kinds of dangers. <laughs> and I'm using that as an example to transition into how this applies to us. The same is true of Jesus' followers. Jesus' followers at a different time, different location, kind of like Colorado in 2021. They may not be the same exact dangers that the disciples had, but make no mistake, there are the same physical and spiritual dangers that we face. And Jesus has the same concern for you and I. He wants us to be able to survive them too. And so that's why the suggestion that I made before applies to us. Let's put up a shelter on this mountain. Let's find everything we need to survive the dangers we face on this mountain. You know what I'm saying? When I asked you before to just try to imagine the dangers the disciples would go through, I have a hunch that you were able to imagine them pretty well. And it's not just because you have a really vivid imagination it's because that's your real life too, isn't it? Absolutely it is. Let me just walk through it a little bit. Like the disciples, you, you kind of have a vision of how things are going to go, right? Do you, do you have a plan for your life? Do you have hopes and dreams? How are those going? Maybe they're going okay, but you know as well as I do that as life goes on, circumstances throw wrenches in those plans, don't they? And in fact, there's a lot of twists and downturns and, and things don't turn out the way we plan at all. And, and how does that affect your relationship with Jesus? How does that affect the way that you feel toward Jesus' promise to you to be with you and uphold you? Well, there's a real danger to doubt those promises then, isn't there? How do you feel about yourself and your relationship with God. I know the way you feel because it's probably the same way I feel. It's easy to, to, to convince ourselves, well, I'm really not that bad. Certainly not as bad as a lot of people. But then we look at the Scriptures and we take a deep, honest look at our own hearts and we realize we haven't even come close to living up to God's perfect standards. And, and the worst part about it is Satan knows that. 
And he comes to us and he accuses us. And he accuses us and he's right. And, and our, our consciences become weighed down. And when our consciences become weighed down, what does that do to your faith? How certain of you are about where you are going to spend eternity. There's a real danger of doubting there, isn't there? What about feeding our faith and feeding our souls? How's that going? We have all these great intentions about strengthening our faith, right? But, but then life comes at us faster than a supersonic jet and it throws all these hurdles in the way, overbooked schedules, exhaustion, stress, all these responsibilities that come and pretty soon our Bibles are collecting dust. And what does that do to our faith? Well, it's in danger of starving, isn't it? And now we come to this time of the year. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we start a brand new season called Lent. And Lent is all about focusing on Jesus' suffering. And, and when we, as soon as we say that, you think as, as if we don't focus on Jesus' gruesome crucifixion and his blood enough, now we're going to solely focus on that? What does that do for your pride and your Savior as you see him like that? What does that do as you share Jesus? Are, are you ashamed of him? There's a real danger of denying him, isn't there? You see what I'm saying? They're the very same dangers that the disciples were dealing with. How can we survive? Well, I'm here to tell you today that Jesus is making a shelter for you on this mountain. This isn't just a history lesson saying, hey, look at what happened a long time ago in Jesus' life or the disciples' life. No, this is for your strengthening. This is for your survival too. As you hear these words in Mark chapter 9, as we meditate on them right now, I want you to ask yourself some questions. What do you see there? Do you see Jesus' clothes dazzling whiter than any detergent could ever bleach them? What you're seeing is your God. Your God who has the power to keep every single one of his promises to you. Your God that has all the glory of the Almighty God and you never have to be ashamed of him. That's who Jesus is to you. What else do you see there? Do you see that enveloping cloud? What a beautiful picture of your God who promises to never leave you but surrounds you with his love every single day. And what do you hear on that mountain? Do you hear that booming voice proclaiming his divine approval of Jesus? Do you know what that means? That is the voice of the one who is accepting Jesus as your substitute. And think about what that means for you now and for all of eternity. Because Jesus lived perfectly, that counts for you. Because Jesus died as a punishment for sin, that counts for you. And because Jesus loves and approves, excuse me, as, if, because God loves and approves of Jesus, that means he loves you and approves of you as well. You're completely forgiven. You're accepted by God because of Jesus, your substitute. What else do you hear on that mountain? Do you hear Jesus talking about rising from the dead? Think about what that assures you of. That assures you that no matter what life can throw at you, no matter what dangers come your way, the grave will never be your forever resting place. You have eternal life. What else do you hear? Do you hear that encouragement to listen to Jesus? That's God assuring you that he's not going to let your faith starve. No, he's going to grow that faith and strengthen that faith through his promises in the Bible as we listen to God's word. You see how important this event is? My encouragement for you today is to hold on to this. Remember this mountaintop experience. Hold on, to you, hold on to it as you live out those difficult days in your life. Hold on to, you, to it as we make this intense journey to the cross during Lent. Hold on to it. And I guarantee you, you will not only survive, you will thrive in all the glory that Jesus is going to the cross to win just for you. What a loving Savior to put
put up this shelter for your survival. Do you get it now? (laughs) Do you know what I was saying at the beginning about Peter? Peter was really close, wasn't he? Now, we can't live on this mountain. (laughs) I'm not suggesting that we, we linger and try to bask in the glory and just ignore all the suffering in our lives. We're not going to go and find rocks and sticks or anything that drops from an elephant and try to make this shelter, no. But maybe this is the, the suggestion. Instead of poking fun at Peter, let's use his words in the days ahead of us. It was good for us to be on this mountain today and to see Jesus as he truly is. To see him in all of his divine glory and know exactly what he came to win for us. Take shelter in that. And then I guarantee you as the physical and the spiritual dangers come your way, you will survive on what you saw here and on what you heard here. Amen. And now may that peace of God that goes beyond all our understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. In response to Jesus' great love for us, we bring him our offerings. And just a reminder that you can find that opportunity to participate in that offering on page one of the service folder that will take you to the the donate page on our website, peacelutheranbolder.com. This is a way that we at Peace join together to say thank you to God and to make sure that we carry on the ministry of sharing Jesus with each other and with our community. To him be praised forever. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Gracious Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day of refreshment that we call Transfiguration Sunday. We thank you for giving us a glimpse of your glory. We confess that so often we are surrounded by all the dangers, both physical and spiritual, that are in this world because of the devil because of the world, because of our own sinful flesh. And we confess to you that so often we have fallen prey to those dangers and we have doubted and we have been ashamed of you and we have denied you and we don't always like to look at the gruesomeness of the cross. And yet, Lord, we thank you for going to the cross to pay for all of those things, to defeat the devil, to defeat temptation, to defeat death itself so that we can have the glory that that you have given us through those things that comes through the forgiveness of sins. Whenever we're going through these dangerous temptations and challenges in our lives, help us to to find shelter in who you truly are, our Almighty God. Help us to find strength in your glory and help us to find uh, strength in your words. Help us to listen to those words and take them to heart so that we can always be prepared and to face those things, and to look forward to the glory that you have won for us on the cross and empty tomb. Lord, be with us and guide us all the way to the cross and beyond. We pray this in your name, and in your name we continue. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing musical meditation is From All That Dwell Below the Sky. One of the reasons for having this is, number one, it it points to all of Jesus' glory that is rightfully his, as we saw on Transfiguration Sunday. And the other reason is it's filled with alleluias. And this will be the last uh, weekend that we use that word alleluia until Easter, as during Lent our our worship is kind of muted. And so we say farewell to that that song of praise, Alleluia, and look forward to, to bursting forth in song with Alleluias on Easter Sunday when our Savior is risen from the dead.
Again, welcome to Peace Lutheran Church. Thank you so much for joining your hearts with ours as we worshiped our Savior today and were strengthened through His Word. Again, my name is Jason Teal, and if there's any way that I can serve you as pastor, just please let me know. My information is here on the bulletin. One exciting thing to share with you would be about our Peace Partners 40 Days in Scripture. It's going to be this online scripture reading and discussion group It's going to start February 17th, that's this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, and go all the way to the day before Easter. So that's 40 days, 40 days. And the idea is 40 days, about 10 to 15 minutes per day. That'll take you through about one to two chapters of the Bible per day. Um, and, And the idea is to hit some main chapters all the way throughout the Bible to give you a really good, solid idea of the story of salvation, how It weaves its way all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the story of salvation in Jesus. And the idea is to have mutual encouragement so that we're able to to read together online, to uh, discuss together online through comments, ask questions. So you'll find all the information you need for that on page 6 of the bulletin. But basically what it is, is it's a private group through our website You'll go to our website and find the online group and join that online group and everything you'll be needed, everything you'll need for that is posted every single day starting February 17th. So if you'd like to join us, check us out online, peacelutheranboulder.com on the online group or if you're having troubles with that at all, just contact me, I'll guide you through it and uh, looking forward to this way to be able to connect and grow together as as a peace family. I pray that God's word has been a blessing for you today. Have a wonderful week in your Lord.
Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. You're likely aware that Wells Christian Aid and Relief responds to events like hurricanes and tornadoes where a whole community is suffering. But another facet of the work focuses on tragedies that affect just a single family, personal grants that can make a life-changing difference for individuals in need. Lake Mills is a, a wonderful bedroom community. It has a lot to offer to families, not only in raising them, but also in the activities on the lake. St. Paul has played an important role in the history of the Lake Mills area. The church has always been there. That has been the constant. That doesn't go anywhere. The ability to go and share in God's word and pray together and ask people to pray for you. And it's a normal Wednesday night, and Landon had started screaming that has had a belly bad headache, and it, was, and it was really bad. It was Ash Wednesday of 2019. It was during, I believe, uh, the time of our Lent service. Uh, he had the seizure. I'll never forget this because it's embedded in my head. I told my brother in law, I said, call 911, something's really wrong here. It took him right to Children's Hospital in Madison. He had a massive brain bleed and it, his outcome was uncertain that he, if he was even going to make it alive after this. So Landon spent about 10 days, he was in a coma. Is he going to wake up? How, how do you make this decision about your eight-year-old child and just like hope that it's going to work, you know? And then as time you know, progressed and we were there for quite some time, I mean Landon was there from March to September. It was very traumatic for everyone, especially when you see a young man go through such an experience, wondering whether or not he would survive this life. But we were also very confident that if that was the Lord's will, we knew that he would be in heaven with his Savior. At that time, he was, Landon was not talking a lot of the time, but he went out of his way to tell the pastor to read him a Bible verse. We had made arrangements uh, that we as pastors would go to the house. I walked into his room, and the first thing he said to me is, Pastor, it's good to see you. Can you please read me a Bible story about Jesus? Read a Bible verse because I wanted to remember Jesus. Jesus means that he died on the cross for all of us. What I loved about all of the pastors at St. Paul's is every single one of them reached out and they were like, what, what can we do to help you? Can we come and visit? Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? What, does, what do you need from us? Well, when I realized you know, how much it was gonna cost uh, for the family to purchase a handicapped accessible van, which legally they had to do uh, to transport him, um, I knew that there was a way for us now to help them. And I found out about Christian Aid and Relief and how they can help in this way from another pastor. We do personal grants for people in our congregations who are just struggling in some aspect of life. Maybe they've got some uh, major medical bills uh, or some other financial challenge. And so we work together with congregations who contact us uh, to give those people some uh, financial uh, assistance that they need. It was just amazing and our, and our congregation uh, to date has collected almost $20,000 to help pay for that van and the balance was covered by Christian Aid and Relief. And without their help, I don't think that would have been possible. <laughs> it's always amazing how God finds another way to get you there or to answer a prayer you maybe didn't even know you had. And so we got the van. I mean, within six weeks, Pastor was like, here you go, we've got this, we're gonna help you. It was the Lord who held them up and it was his strength that carried them through and they regularly confess that, and that was beautiful. It's just so humbling. People who we have never met, never will meet here on earth, who were willing to help Landon and help us do the things that are most important is still to be able to travel together, and um, ultimately it's to go back and have Landon worship his Savior in, in church. To see the relief, and I think that's what Christian Aid and Relief is all about giving them the relief that they're not alone and that they have others they can count on.
Landon's story is a beautiful illustration how Wells Christian Aid and Relief offers opportunities to demonstrate our Christian love. Whether it's a natural disaster, or a need at one of our world missions, or a family that's hurting, Wells Christian Aid and Relief is there as a way to show love to our neighbor, reflecting the great love Jesus has shown us. Stricter watch to keep 